We're going to conclude this morning um, with a topic which uh, could not be more important on the human side, um, obesity. We're going to have three speakers. Uh, first, Dr. Dominique Griffon, who is a professor in small animal surgery and associate dean uh, for research at Western University uh, at the veterinary school there. Her research interests focus on clinical applications of stem cells and biomaterials in orthopedics. We're also going to have Dr. Richard Nelson. Uh, he is a professor of small animal medicine at UC Davis. Uh, his research is clinically based with a focus on the diagnosis and management of diabetes, hypothyroidism, and diseases of the adrenal glands in dogs and cats. On the human side, um, a colleague of mine, Dr. David Heber, who is the director of the UCLA Center for Human Nutrition. He's the founding chief of the Division of Clinical Nutrition here in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Heber is board certified in internal medicine and endocrinology and metabolism, uh, and we're delighted to have all three of them here today. We'll be starting uh, again with, our, uh, with Dr. Griffon. Well, good morning, everyone. I have to admit that uh, talking about obesity right before lunch makes for an interesting timing. And um, <laughs> in the spirit of full disclosure, I can assure you that there is no hidden message um, in my talk. Uh, I am actually a, a specialist in small animal orthopedic surgery, and you may therefore wonder about why am I so interested about obesity. So I will be using a case to uh, illustrate the impact of obesity um, on musculoskeletal diseases. The case is Misty, a uh, 140 pound Labrador, presented with a chronic uh, lameness and cranial cruciate ligament disease. Uh, for those of you that may not be uh, familiar with the anatomy, the cranial cruciate ligament is this uh, uh, ligament that is pointed by the blade right here that says CCL. Um, the anatomy between dogs and humans is pretty similar. We call it cranial cruciate ligament. Uh, our human counterparts call it anterior cruciate ligament. It's fancier, but it's really the same uh, um, anatomic relationship, it basically prevents the tibia from moving forward every time you step down. When this ligament is uh, ruptured, then obviously the tibia is going to move forward and that creates instability and pain. In dogs, the majority of these cases, uh, by opposition to our human counterparts, are not related to trauma, but they are related to a degenerative process which we're not quite sure why it happens. But in that case, there was no history of trauma. The dog was lame, and we uh, were able to diagnose cruciate ligament instability based on our palpation of the knee. Now, what makes for another um, interesting uh, approach in that case and illustrate our One Health um, approach as veterinarians is that not only do we have to manage the pet, but very often we have to also manage the owner. Um, in that case, the dog happened to um, belong to a couple whose husband um, had been out of work for a while and was pretty much um, spending most of his time with the dog. Um, we were not able to coin a diagnosis on the owner other than it took about an hour for us to convince him that yes, we would need to hospitalize the dog to do the surgery. The minimum amount of time that we would be comfortable um, hospitalizing the dog without compromising um, the, the standard of care of the dog was to keep the dog in the hospital overnight after the surgery, and no, we could unfortunately not accommodate his request to spend the night in the cage with the dog. <laughs> um, so the dog underwent a surgery that we call a tibial plateau leveling osteotomy. Um, I realize that I don't have an audience of surgeon, but basically what it is, is we shift, we rotate the tibia uh, proximally to make it a flat surface so that when the femur hits the, t the tibia, it's now hitting a flat surface rather than a slope. And that in itself prevents that cranial translation of the tibia. It's a technique that has become uh, very popular for a large breed dog. Um, there is... A, the jury is still out there whether it's really better than other um, strategy, but this is the, the, the approach that the owner um, chose, partly because there is some evidence that dogs that have this surgery tend to walk faster after um, the surgery. Within a couple of days, they're able to put the weight on their leg, which was relevant in that case because, remember, the dog is, weighs 140 pounds. That means if the dog is not able to use 
the one leg, all the weight is going to shift on the other three legs, and we know that we already have a predisposition for the other limb to become affected with cranial cruciate ligament rupture. So the, the surgery was pretty uneventful. We sent the dog home um, um, a day after surgery, and then we get a phone call about three weeks after surgery uh, from the owner saying that the dog has been licking at the incision, he has trouble keeping the e-collar uh, on the dog. The e-collar is this plastic um, collar that we put on dogs to prevent them from licking at incisions that there is draining from the open incision for one week. He had been communicating with his veterinarians over the phone. Um, I suspect that the veterinarian was trying his best to advise the owner in the management of the case, but for whatever reason, um, the dog had not returned to the veterinarian and was invited to come back to us. Um, in a teaching hospital, our first line of action for these type of emergency calls go through the resident. So uh, one of my residents received the case and um, on the way to um, school, the um, owner described that the dog was free in the car and somehow twisted his leg and was no longer using the leg at all by the time he got to the hospital. Again, because of its weight and our slick floors, we had to get a, a, a gurney to um, bring the dog into the hospital and into our radiology unit. And as a comparison, these are the radiographs that we had obtained after surgery. Those are the radiographs that we obtained three weeks later. So in general, when we put a plate on a bone, it's supposed to stay on the bone. Um, if the plate is off the bone, that's what we call an implant failure. Um, so in that case, you can see that basically the tibia has been pulled away from the plate. Not only did it pull away from the plate, it actually fractured the medial aspect of the tibia. In other words, the tibia is now split in half. Um, for those of you that are um, familiar with radiology, there's also some heterogeneity in the um, appearance of the bone. It, it's not a, a nice uniform radiopacity. That's a sign of infection. So now we have implant failure and infection on uh, this dog, and um, we need to bring the news to the owner. So at this point, the resident comes to me and says, I think I'm going to need your help. <laughs> now we spend two hours in the room breaking the news that after spending uh, about $3,000 on the initial surgery, we're looking at a revision which is going to cost um, at least as much, even without you know, help as much as we can. And obviously the prognosis is not as good as when we started because now we have less bone to work with and we have an infection. The owner decide, and, and of course this owner being out of work, money was an issue. So the owner still decide to go ahead with the surgery uh, the surgery is challenging. This is an intra-op view um, uh, here on the upper left, and I apologize again for the timing right before lunch. Um, but this is basically a very small plate that we have compared to the original plate. The reason why we have a small plate is because we don't have much bone to work with. Around that plate, we have uh, uh, beads of calcium sulfate impregnated with tobramycin. Um, the role of these beads is basically to leach out antibiotics and while they resorb, promote bone growth. Um, they act as a network for cells to, to grow. Um, because that repair is not strong enough for that dog, we have to bridge the stifle with an, extra, uh, an external skeletal um, fixator. So the surgery um, goes about as, as expected. Um, two days later, this time notice we managed to keep the dog one, one more day. Um, the dog is unable to stand at the time of discharge. When the resident goes um, in the cage to, to bring the dog to the owner, uh, he realizes that, that the dog cannot stand. This is the radiograph. Um, so again, we like to see the femur as a straight line. <laughs> And you may be able to appreciate uh, on the, on the uh, right side that the femur is no longer continuous. We have a fracture through a pin placed in the femur. Now, in hindsight, um, um, if you look at the, the cortices, which are the, the white lines on each side of the bone, they are thinner than what they should be in a dog that size. So if you put together thin cortices with... Um, um, 
a frame that is much heavier than what the bone stock is designed to support, you have a, a potential concern for having a stress rising effect right where we put the, the pin, which may explain the fracture. But at the time, this is not something that is reported in the literature. Uh, this is something that is coming out now um, where we see in lo very large giant breed dogs, such as uh, St. Bernard, for example, affected by uh, chronic lameness, such as hip dysplasia, we see a thinning of the cortices. And that is obviously going to affect our management when it comes to placing implants. At that point, my resident refuses to talk to the owner. <laughs> we have spent uh, uh, about $5,500 on uh, that dog. And now I have another couple of hours of discussion, giving them the option. We do have the option of repairing. We can probably be creative and come up with something even more complex. However, the prognosis keeps going down. Remember, we also have an infection to deal with. And uh, the cost keeps going up. At this point, the owner opt for amputation. Uh, now, again, I'm going to have a, a, a dog on three legs which I know has a history of cruciate disease on one side, i.e. is predisposed to the same thing on the opposite side and weighs 140 pounds. I think at this point the owner pretty much realized that obesity was an issue in the dog and was a lot more willing to work with us to um, tackle that issue. And so this is the outcome, um, the pictures pre-op post-op. The, the bottom here is not the dog, but it is to illustrate the fact that we ended up having to place that dog in a cart post-op after the amputation because I was so concerned about him rupturing the opposite cruciate. And, and dogs walk very well on three legs. They, they can have normal lifestyle on three legs, not on two legs. <laughs> so I had to make sure that we saved that contralateral limb. Um, the entire treatment on that dog was just based on the diet adjustment, and that meant elimination of table scraps um, and uh, a serious diet. This also, honestly, I felt terrible, and so I offered free rechecks for a year just to do a flow chart with the weight. And I would see the owners pretty much every six weeks come through the clinic and measure their weight on the same scale, give them a little flow chart, and really provided that kind of support that they needed to be able to keep track of the weight loss. So um, this case illustrates obviously a dramatic uh, uh, example of the impact of uh, obesity on orthopedic disease. In the, again, the spirit of full disclosure, um, not all my cases turn out that way. This, this was an exception. It's actually one of my worst nightmare. Part of it is because they kept coming back, <laughs> which is not, not uncommon for orthopedics. When they go back, they still come back to you. Um, but it, it is something that now we're becoming more aware. Um, and it does make sense. Basically, obesity results uh, uh, very simply from uh, an imbalance between inadequate energy utilization and excessive dietary intake. So a lot of it depends on physical activity. And in the case of dogs with orthopedic disease, um, either part of their post-operative management or because they're lame, we're going to decrease the physical activity. Uh, most, I would say, 95% of our post-op um, regimen will include decreasing physical therapy, no running, no jumping. We are aware, however, of the importance of rehabilitation, so we're making progress on this. Um, but you know, in this case, there was lameness and pain, so I can't tell the owner, well, you need to exercise the dog more so they can lose some weight. Um, in that case, we had that, that transition, and yet, in a lot of the cases, we failed to address the, the energy content. I mean, on the post-op phase, we don't tell owner, you need to have your dog on a, a restricted diet. So um, I'll give you now some facts uh, about what we know about the relationship between obesity and orthopedic disease in small animal. Um, we know that there is a predisposition to cranial cruciate ligament disease. The predisposition to postoperative complications, however, has not been clearly established in, uh, in the literature, but it is a clinical impression among surgeons. Certainly, um, obesity can make our surgery more complicated 
and therefore may potentially increase the risk of complication just by this fact. Now, what we know between the relationship of obesity and, and orthopedic disease is essentially focusing on osteoarthritis, and I think the same relationship has been established and is well known in humans. Uh, for example, with osteoarthritis of the, of the hips, uh, one study found that the return to ideal weight decreased the severity of lameness. Now again, um, this case uh, illustrates two common limitations in the veterinary literature. The first one is the number of dogs enrolled in the study, only nine dogs. It's very difficult for us to have large-scale study with good follow-up. And the second one is the quality of the follow-up. The, the visual assessment score is a subjective score. And again, it is difficult for us to generate quantitative data because it requires more equipment, more time. And so a lot of, of evidence in the veterinary literature is not as strong as in the human literature. However, we have a couple of good studies, and this one was a study that looks at the uh, impact on osteoarthritis of the elbow and the shoulder. This was a study uh, with 48 Labradors uh, in a lifespan study. So consider the cost associated with this type of study and the, the manpower to be able to generate this data. Those were paired little mates. One uh, little mate was fed 75% of the diet of the other little mate. There was a 26% body weight difference, and the body, the body condition score that we use, 5 is normal. So 6.7 is uh, slightly elevated. It is elevated, it's obesity. And 4.6 is the low end of normal. And uh, in this study, they found a lower severity of osteoarthritis at six years. And what I think is a take-home message for owners, increased longevity by 1.8 years in dogs with restricted diet. So that, I think, is a message that can resonate when we talk to owners. Because 1.8 in terms of uh, a dog's life is, is pretty significant. <laughs> so in conclusion, uh, we share the same concern as our human counterparts in terms of the increase in obesity. Notice the percentage, 22 to 40 percent, depending on which study you look at. But those numbers really parallel um, that of humans. So with that, I will um, pass on to my uh, next speaker, and we will revisit the uh, uh, correlation between the, the two diseases during our discussion. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Almost done. I want to thank the organizers who invited me to attend this meeting. I wasn't sure what I was getting into. They said, we, obesity session, uh, I'm not into obesity per se. I'm kind of into endocrine and diabetes. And so the case that I want to present is uh, obesity as it relates to diabetes. And we all recognize that diabetes is becoming a real serious problem uh, in uh, humans in our country. And it's also becoming a real serious problem in pets as well, dogs and cats. Uh, the last 10 years, there's also been a tremendous increase in the prevalence of diabetes in cats, more so than in dogs. Yes, dogs and cats do get diabetes. Yes, people do inject insulin into diabetic dogs and cats, and they do actually quite well most of the time. What's interesting for us is that we actually deal with both types of diabetes that human MDs deal with. We deal with type 1 diabetes in dogs. <clears throat> diabetes in dogs is an immune-mediated attack on the islets. There's been quite a few studies that have documented that. And that attack <clears throat> is very progressive and rapid. And at the time we make the diagnosis of diabetes in a dog, they basically have no insulin secretory capabilities they're treated with insulin and then other ancillary therapies to try to help insulin be effective in controlling the hyperglycemia that exists. In the cat, there's absolutely no evidence for an immune-mediated attack on the islets. In fact, cats immunologically are quite different than dogs. We don't see a whole lot of immune-mediated diseases in the cat, or we see a lot of them in the dog. The cat is more type 2, the type 2 diabetes that human physicians deal with in that it tends to be what appears to be a progressive, uh, slow deterioration in beta cell function and beta cell population. And the cat has the potential to go from being normal into a subclinical, into a clinical that can be treated with non-insulin modalities into ultimate insulin dependency. 
We take that for granted today, but 15 years ago, in the uh, mid-90s, as veterinarians, we had no idea what was going on in cats. And the case that I want to present is one of <clears throat> several that um, kind of went through the exact same thing as this case uh, and uh, kind of laid the groundwork for understanding exactly what's going on in terms of the development of diabetes in the cat. And this is the story of Yum Yum. And Yum Yum <clears throat> was an eight-year-old male castrated Himalayan. Body weight was 6.7 kilograms. That's a big cat. Most cats weigh around three to four kilograms. So we're talking about a pretty hefty cat. This is my son holding up Yum Yum. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. He had a body condition score of seven out of nine. We tend to rank animals uh, not only by body weight, by objectively how they look at, from anywhere from one to nine, where one is they're emaciated, nine, they're a walking coffee table. Anything, most, most cats are four to five. You want four to five is kind of normal, anything over that, and they're a little bit on the, on the heavy side. So Yum Yum was uh, originally owned by a trucking company in San Jose, and it lived in the office. And uh, during the week for five days, you know, it was an office pet, they fed it people food, they never fed it any cat food at all. And on the weekends when they left, they just put a whole bunch of food in the bowl and left and came back on Monday and kind of took up where they left off. So Yum Yum had five days of, inter of uh, interaction with people and getting people food, and then two days of a huge bowl of people food with nobody around to eat it. He presented to us um, for a problem with polyuria and polydipsia, drinking too much water, urinating too much. In the cat, when we deal with PUPD, there's really only three diseases that do that. The most common is gonna be uh, kidney failure, chronic kidney disease, second is diabetes mellitus, and third is feline hyperthyroidism. So the, the differential is very short, diagnostic evaluation relatively easy, the CBC biochem panel urinalysis T4, and you're gonna be able to sort out these three. In Yum Yum's situation, he had a blood sugar of 452, which is kind of a typical blood sugar that we see in an untreated, newly diagnosed diabetic dog or cat. Um, normal blood sugar in a cat, argue, people will argue about it. There's issues with cats and stress hyperglycemia. They're very sympathoadrenal. They've got a tremendous uh, epinephrine catecholamine surge. You saw it on the behavior one where the cat suddenly is at them. Those who work with cats know what I'm talking about. Uh, and as a consequence, it gets hard to really pin down what's true normal fasting blood sugar in a cat, but most accepted is less than 150. He also had spillage of glucose in the urine, and he had ketones in the urine. So by definition, he's a diabetic uh, ketotic animal. The blood work failed to show uh, a significant metabolic acidosis, so we would call him diabetic ketosis, not diabetic ketoacidosis. Started to talk to one of the secretaries at the trucking office about, well, Yum Yum's diabetic. You're going to have to give him insulin shots. You can't leave him for two days, you know, the specific diet and whatnot. They elected to euthanize the cat. Uh, they didn't want to deal with it. They just said, well, the environment's not right, so go ahead and put them down. I didn't really want to do that because now I'm clicking on and putting on my research hat, and I'm thinking, boy, I really want to study this cat because we were, I was looking at uh, doing a lot of different studies in diabetic cats at that particular point in my career. So I just said, well, is it okay if you donate the kitty? Can we, I'll take the cat. I'll find it a home. I'm figuring, okay, I'll get a student, you know, a fourth-year vet student. They'll take it, <laughs> or maybe a resident. You know, I can get my studies done, and then off it goes. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, and the new name for Yum Yum became Yum Yum Nelson. <clears throat> and actually, when I took it home, my daughter was about 10 years old at the time. I took it home, and I said, well, we're, we're coming in. I got a diabetic cat. His name is Bud. Uh, you know, I have Amos, Bob, Wally, Bud. But then about a week later, the resident who was helping me called up and said, uh, how's Yum Yum doing? And my wife heard it, and she told my daughter, and so I was stuck. <laughs> I went back to Yum Yum Nelson. At the time that we made the diagnosis, one of the things that we were looking at was trying to figure out insulin secretory capabilities within these diabetic cats. And we were using uh, glucagon, IV glucagon stimulation test. And in Yum Yum's situation, Baseline insulin was non-detectable, despite a uh, significant severe hyperglycemia. And serum insulin concentrations basically remained very, very low uh, 
uh, following the administration of glucagon. Glucagon should cause a potent uh, release of insulin if you've got beta cells that are functioning. So we made a tentative diagnosis of an insulin-dependent diabetic. We've got ketosis. Ketosis implies significant insulin deficiency. We've got no insulin. We've got no ability to raise the insulin. We've, uh, <clears throat> you know, we've got hyperglycemia. So we treated him in a standard way with regular crystalline insulin uh, and then shifted him over to a longer-acting insulin, which at that time the one that we use most commonly in cats was common in human lenti, humulin L from Eli Lilly. Um, and at that time, we didn't recognize the interplay of carbohydrate and protein in the diet. And so the, the typical dietary approach was to go with a diet that had low calorie density, and that meant increasing the fiber content. And we used that then to try to, to not only help uh, decrease postprandial hyperglycemia, but get the kitty to lose some weight. Correcting obesity in a cat is very, very difficult. In a dog, you can exercise a dog, and you can increase caloric expenditure, and you have a chance of getting them to lose weight. There is no way to exercise a cat. So everything in terms of correcting obesity is strictly caloric restriction and decreasing the number of calories that go into the animal. Most of the time, you're not successful because clients don't stay to the treatment regimen. In this case, it was my own cat, so we stuck to it. I convinced my wife not to free choice feed the kitty. This is the, uh, just showing what happened over the ensuing six months. We were able to gradually lose about uh, two kilograms of body weight on Yum Yum. And if you look at the far uh, right-hand side, you can see the average blood sugar over 10 hours. We do blood sugar measurements over a 10-hour period. The average sugar dropped from 345 down to 113, which means this cat has gone from uh, an insulin-requiring state to a non-insulin-requiring state. We were able to take him off the insulin, and we were able to maintain his blood sugar in an acceptable range. Cats don't start to spill sugar in the urine until it gets up over 250. And if they don't spill sugar in the urine, they don't get PUPD. So Yum Yum's doing great. The question then is, how is this possible? Because the cat doesn't have any insulin based on our blood test that we had done six months earlier. So the first thing that I did when he reverted was to come back and repeat that IV glucose tolerance test. And when I repeated it at this time, six months later, all of a sudden we have insulin secretory capabilities. What we're looking at here in the blue line is at the time the diagnosis was made, and in the yellow line is at the time of diabetic remission. And all of a sudden, we've got functional beta cells that can respond to glucagon and secrete insulin. And that shouldn't happen in an insulin-dependent situation. Beta cells just don't undergo hyperplasia and regrow and come back. Once they're gone, they're gone. So the question then became, what is going on in this animal, and how is this possible? The answer lied in looking at the eyelets, which we almost never get to do. But one of the studies that I was doing at that time was taking these cats that revert and getting a pancreatic biopsy so that we could look histologically at the eyelets. My, my uh, wall to getting that done in Yum Yum was my wife. So <laughs> one day I just you know, woke up and said, honey, got to take Yum Yum into the clinic for a procedure. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. OK. I dealt with the consequences 48 hours later. But at any rate, we brought Yum Yum into the clinic, went in, got a biopsy, and Yum Yum's histopath is in the middle. On your left is normal immunocytochemical staining uh, for insulin in a healthy cat with all the orange-looking color uh, representing functional beta cells. On your right is a typical histologic finding in diabetic cats where we're doing the necropsy at the time of death where their eyelets are totally effaced with amyloid. And in the middle is Yum Yum, where we've got a combination of some amyloid in the eyelets, but not total effacement, and we still have functional beta cells. Okay? <clears throat> what that means, and we did not recognize this until we started doing these uh, biopsies on these kitties uh, at the time that they underwent reversion. What it means, or what it suggests, is that we've got this progression of destruction that's going on in these cats from normal to amyloid deposition to complete effacement, and a, a transition from normal to impaired insulin secretion to no insulin secretion. And that gets us into uh, amylin. And islet amyloidosis is specific for the islets. And amylin is the uh, peptide that is, results in amyloid. And what's interesting is that the amino acid sequencing of amylin in the cat is very similar to the human. 
And in fact, the cat is an excellent model for type 2 diabetes in people, not the dog. The dog has amylin, but the dog does not form amyloid. Amyloid results from increased amylin secretion. Amylin is produced by the beta cells. It's stored in the secretory vacuoles along with insulin. And whenever you have insulin secretion, you have amylin secretion. And when you have excessive insulin secretion, you have excessive amylin secretion. And in the cat, that, results in, that can result in aggregation and a deposition of amylin as amyloid. And, it, and that whole process causes apoptosis to the cells in the islets. And so it's a gradual, progressive kind of a destruction that's going on. And that kind of uh, uh, opened up our eyes in the veterinary arena to uh, this whole concept of diabetes in cats and uh, how some of them um, you know, can respond to diet, can respond to oral hypoglycemic drugs, and others cannot. It basically boils down to what's the insulin resistance causing hyperinsulinemia and how many beta cells are left. And in Yum Yum's case, and in most cats, the obesity is the key factor because obesity is a real problem for us. People feed cats free choice. My wife feeds my cats free choice. I got fat cats, you know, and I try to talk to her, and she says, I don't know what I'm talking about. And she <laughs> continues to feed the high amounts of food. Okay. So obesity, insulin resistance, to override the resistance, you increase your insulin secretion, which results in increased amylin, which over time results in aggregation and destruction. So Yum Yum, at this stage of the game, just to kind of follow up with what happened with him, um, he's a sub, what I would consider to be a subclinical diabetic. He doesn't have normal islets. We didn't really change the diet. We tried to keep his body weight where it was. We tried to avoid insulin-resistant medications like prednisolone uh, and some other medications. And, you know, periodic evaluations, making sure that he's kind of holding his own and staying in a uh, relatively non-clinical situation. He did develop clinical diabetes about six months later, and I treated him with glipizide, which is an oral sulfonylurea. We did some studies that show that glipizide uh, does, in fact, promote insulin secretion in the cat when you give it orally. And he responded to the glipizide for about eight months, and then ultimately he went on to require an insulin to control his hyperglycemia and his clinical signs. He lived about two years, and then he ultimately ended up dying from metastatic uh, exocrine pancreatic carcinoma. And that is the story of Yum Yum. Thank you. That was a very interesting talk, Dr. Nelson, and, I, and I'll comment during the discussion section because I'm not only Director of Center for Human Nutrition, but I'm also a, an endocrinologist with a background in reproductive endocrinology, but also an interest in type 2 diabetes, which I coined diabesity about 20 years ago because 95% of all uh, type 2 diabetes is related to obesity. One out of three Medicare dollars in the United States is spent on complications of type 2 diabetes. 570,000 Americans are on renal dialysis, so this is probably one of the most important health problems we'll deal with. And I think uh, as an owner of a Shih Tzu and Shih Tzu Yorkie mix and a former owner of a Bichon Frise with type 1 diabetes, I can attest to uh, this problem. Now, a friend of mine, Jimmy Bell at Hammersmith Hospital, uh, showed this slide from the United Kingdom that about 40 percent of dogs were overweight and 20 percent were obese. And the degree to which dogs were overweight was directly related to the body mass index of their owners. Furthermore, the degree of overweight was positively related to the duration of ownership of those pets. Now, uh, one of the solutions for canine obesity, <laughs> get a thin owner, number one. Number two, and I we had a little discussion with Dr. Nelson preparing these talks, is be a cat, because actually statistically there's no significant relationship between the degree of overweight of cats and the BMI of their owners. And this may be more in England than here, because cats that are allowed to go outside separately are less dependent on their owners with respect to physical activity and food intake. And I can tell you my personal schedule of waking up in the morning is totally revolves around my dog's need for food. So I can tell you there's this major social impact on uh, obesity. 
So what we're finding now is you've heard this morning from behaviorists and pathologists and oncologists, there is a spectrum here for obesity. It is not simply uh, one receptor or one drug. We've worked on every drug for obesity that's ever come up, and, and most of them don't work. Um, the behavior, social science, and public health aspects are extremely important. Uh, and then we have molecular cellular models. I want to leave you with just a few key thoughts so you can understand obesity and be better able to apply it to your animal uh, subjects as well as for us to do some research. When you break it down, in the last 20 years, there have been about 20 different peptide hormones discovered related to obesity, beginning with leptin. And many of these are related to an adaptation to starvation. We are not adapted to obesity. Even leptin itself, when it was made as a drug and injected into humans, obese humans are resistant to leptin as they're resistant to insulin. So what actually happens is when you starve, your leptin level falls, you are stimulated to search for food, eat more, and deposit it uh, as fat. When you become obese, your leptin level goes up together with your insulin level, but you're resistant to both insulin and leptin. So giving people more leptin when they're obese does not lead to weight loss. And the similar story applies for most of the other long list of hormones I don't have time to discuss. But just remember, we're well adapted to starvation, poorly adapted to overnutrition. As a result, it takes a lot of exercise to make up for a little dietary indiscretion. If you eat two ounces of potato chips, you have to run three miles in 30 minutes to burn off those calories. Two regular sodas, you have to bicycle eight miles in 30 minutes. Now, why is that? Well, because in nature, as we saw with the horses and the lions and all the animals, they like to run around. They're running around searching for food. So in the ancient forest, you didn't know where that next squirrel you wanted to eat was going to be. So you might spend three days running around the forest, and you've got to be able to hang on to fat and have energy so you don't starve to death while you're looking for your next meal. Today, that's not a problem because most fast food joints are within six miles of the average, six minutes of the average American, I should say. So there's food everywhere. There's 24-hour stores available. Our plant-based diets from 50,000 years ago were plant-based with colorful fruits and vegetables. Humans are the only ones who have color vision among uh, mammals. Uh, birds have color vision, but our dogs and cats are colorblind. And it's believed that humans and birds evolved this to pick colorful fruits off of a green background. So in the past, there was subsistence agriculture until the Industrial Revolution about 200 years ago, food scarcity, and people actually, actually experienced hunger, which is a rare phenomenon today in most people in the suburbs and the country clubs. Now, if you look at the Western diet pattern today, we have industrialized agriculture. We have hybridized corn that's subsidized by the government. We have high fructose corn syrup. We have corn oil, corn sugar, corn-fed beef, and increased availability of food, poor food quality. Obesity and chronic diseases result from that. So what are the differences between the ancient diet and the modern diet, and what can you take away from this for your optimized animal diet, be it in a zoo or in a domestic situation? The diet, ancient diet, was about 10 to 15 percent fat. Today it's 35 to 50 percent fat. And omega-6 to omega-3 ratios, 3 to 1 in fruits and vegetables, anywhere from 10 to 30 to 1 in a human blood sample in the United States due to the increased amount of corn oil and other vegetable oil intake. Because what happens when you buy a bottle of corn oil in the grocery store, the omega-3 fatty acids have been stripped out of there to give it greater shelf life because the omega-3s in there would also make it look cloudy, and that people wouldn't buy a lot of cloudy oil. So the omega threes have been removed, and we have very we have we can argue for an omega three deficiency, if you will, in our diet because we have way too much fat. Total fatty acid deficiency doesn't occur until you have less than five percent of your total dietary calories as fat. And I have never seen a case here at UCLA in 30 years in anyone with an intact intestinal tract. So everybody's got at least 10% fat in their diet. They're not going to be fatty acid deficient. You need a little bit of linoleic and a little bit of linolenic acid. These are the two predominant precursor fatty acids. But humans cannot convert the short chain fatty acids like linolenic into fish oils, which are 20 and 22 carbons long. Fish can do that. It's also found in many types of algae. So you have to both lower the total fat intake and reduce the omega-6 and then supplement omega-3 or eat ocean-caught fish. What about fructose? Well, fructose is great for you if it's found in a fruit. It comes with antioxidants. It comes with fiber. Uh, average fruit has about 70 calories. Average vegetable has about 50. But when it's hidden in foods like ketchup, soft drinks with 150 calories, 37 and a half grams of carbohydrate, you've got a problem. 
And then plant proteins obviously have lower calories. And all these foods are rich in vitamins and minerals in the ancient time and not today. So obesity is defined as excess body fat, not simply excess weight. Uh, these two guys have the same body mass index, but clearly a very different body shape. We can look at this with an MRI, and I recently read in the Wall Street Journal they're making new larger MRIs for bigger Americans that can hold up to 650 pound Americans as opposed to getting people on a diet. Uh, but you can see the signals, uh, the MRI signals here. So that actually about 40% of men of normal body weight, I'm sorry, 45% of women in normal body weight and normal waist circumference have increased intra-abdominal fat. 60% of men at normal body weight, normal waist circumference have increased intra-abdominal fat. Why that's important is the intra-abdominal fat is the link to all these diseases related to obesity. It's where you store your fat, because when you have fat in the abdomen, you just lean over forward and keep looking for food. <laughs> now, uh, that would be tougher in your legs. Now, this is related to inflammation because your abdominal fat grows like a tumor. It grows its own blood vessels called neovascularization, which occurs in tumors as well. And the late Judah Folkman, who discovered angiogenesis, actually gave angiogenesis inhibitors to obese mice that were genetically obese, and they couldn't become obese. They couldn't grow the blood vessels to make the new fat. What happens is those are lousy blood vessels, though. They don't deliver oxygen to the cells. The cells start to die. That gives a signal to your bone marrow, and white blood cells come into the abdomen, causing a systemic whole body inflammation. So not only do fat cells make hormones, but they cause systemic inflammation. When you reduce calories, as was done with the cat, the Himalayan cat, what's going to happen is if you reduce the total diet, you're going to be protein deficient. It's very important to supplement protein when you're cutting calories because you want to maintain the muscle mass. What happens to postmenopausal women is they lose muscle at the time of menopause, and even though they're eating the same number of calories, they increase their body fat because muscle burns more calories than fat. So maintaining the muscle mass by eating more protein, and that protein also helps to su suppress the appetite, both in animals and humans. So what are the results of our worldwide epidemic of obesity and overweight? Mexico is now number one in the world at 68% overweight and obese. US is number two at 65%. And these are very deceptive numbers because they're based on body mass index. So you might have a thin animal with a high percent internal body fat and high intra-abdominal fat. This is especially true in China and in South Asia, people from this uh, Asian Indian peninsula, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Ceylon, India, have a high incidence of type 2 diabetes and heart disease. So we have to start doing body composition. This hits the entire medical spectrum. Diseases like asthma, which we never thought were related to obesity, are related to obesity. They're inflammatory diseases. 58% of my patients, when I got here to UCLA 30 years ago, it was really funny, uh, I got here in 1983 about, and they said to me, listen, I don't know what you're doing here, Dave. You don't have any procedures. You're a nice guy, but what are you going to do? So I said, well, just give me some slips in a room, and I'll take it from there. 58% of my patients had low back pain, knee pain, various kinds of orthopedic problems. I was listed as a physical medicine doctor by the insurance companies after my first two years here. <laughs> so the case of the overweight dog with the bad leg is very, very relevant. We spend a lot of money in this country on total knee uh, replacements, and this whole area of diabetes Renal failure, we'll have more time to talk about it, but this is an area where we could really do a lot of preventive medicine. So thank you all very much. I wanted to ask Dr. Nelson, so there's a doctor here at UCLA by the name of Dr. Peter Butler, and we have this islet cell transplant research center, and he's the one actually who years ago described this whole amylin amyloid connection, and what actually happens is, is that the um, amylin is secreted together with insulin. It's a short loop feedback on insulin secretion, but in obese animals, there's about a hundredfold more amylin excreted, so I'm wondering if... In this uh, yum yum, whether losing weight, you reduce some of this amylin, which then it gets into the endoplasmic reticulum and it gloms up the entire, uh, it's a misfolded protein, so it completely gloms up the uh, cell and does cause apoptosis and inflammation. So through weight loss, you reduce the inflammation, you may have reduced the amylin as well. Yes. <laughs> No, I think that that's possible. And the, the, no one's ever really looked at it in a cat. 
you know very interesting we we actually are one of our biggest problems is we don't really have a sense of what's going on in the islets until they die and by then it's kind of end stage so the whole sequence uh, is not really well established yeah there was a doctor here many many years ago now no longer alive ernst drenick in 1970 wrote a famous paper in jama which uh, the endocrinologists will know about in which he uh, identified that it's a two to ten year period for these cells to die so you start out with normal insulin normal glucose then you have high insulin and normal glucose and then you have uh, low insulin and high glucose and then finally the cells burn out and this takes about 10 years so our, our window of opportunity to prevent di to diabetes is to treat every uh, obese animal like a, like a, uh, a dog for orthopedic complaints or uh, type 2 diabetes in cats with a healthy weight management diet we're seeing a lot I go to PetSmart all the time now and my dog my wife goes it's very funny it's replaced Toys R Us for us you know so we do you like this one no Okay, <laughs> how about this one? <laughs> you know, <Thank> that. <laughs> so that's we have little shopping trips that we replace the kids. So, um, but I think you know this is an area. How can we get uh, vets? And I know a lot of them are already sensitized to this to get to prevent obesity earlier on with dogs and cats. I think that the, f the fundamental issue with obesity in dogs and cats is related to the owners. I agree And the that. belief that, uh, you know, especially in cats, a heavy cat is a healthy cat. That, that's the dog I hear from my own wife, you know. They, they, I want them to be fat. If they're not fat, they, they're not healthy. Um, so, the, so the attack has to be really directed at the client or the owner of the animals and a recognition of all the problems that develop as a result of becoming obese, the difficulty of correcting the obesity once you get there, and the correlation between what they're doing, especially with treats and not so much ex normal exercise activity, is ultimately resulting in that obesity. Yeah, there was a slide I didn't show where a guy's riding a truck on a little island. There's one, ro one road into the island, and he's got the dog and he's driving a truck, and then the dog's being held outside the truck. So I think getting people to walk their dogs is a great thing on the human side as well as for the dogs. And, you know, in the exercise area, Dr. Griffon, is there anything orthopedically? Do you do physical rehab after you do surgery as well in animals? Because I wasn't aware of that. So... Uh Yes, here's the, the problem that we have is um, a lot of owners do not bring their animal for obesity per se. They're going to bring it because of other problems. And they may see an internist because of endocrinology problem. Um, but otherwise, before that, the majority of them will come for orthopedic problem, either osteoarthritis or cruciate disease or hip dysplasia or um, neurological condition like this disease in Dachshund. And then they get treated by a uh, neurologist or orthopedic uh, surgeon who are not necessarily the best person to be dealing with obesity for a variety of reasons. One of them being it's not their specialty and they are already overwhelmed of where the caseload as it is. And the second component is that it is a very difficult problem to tackle for which we do not have uh, a standardized miracle treatment. And it got to a point where I would tell the owner, you know, I really wish that I could tell you there's a surgery that I could do to fix the problem. Unfortunately, your best strategy will be to get your dog to lose weight. And that was uh, a, a very unfortunate message for me to deliver. So at this point, I started working with actually a rehabilitation program. And what it did is um, allowed me to tie in the exercise with the weight management side of it through um, a team that was specialized and dedicated to dealing with these type of, of issues. And I think it has a couple of advantages. It, it frees up the surgeon so that they can do their surgery and whatever. And it may be more cost effective for owners to be going through a rehab center rather than going to a specialist to have the long-term follow-up care that, that they need. Um, so yes, there are some programs that are coming up. Some of them are called like Shape Up Pup program, which is the equivalent of the Weight Watchers um, program. Um, <clears throat> but it's, it's by far not um, disseminated, again, because I think the orthopedic surgeons are very busy when they see their cases. They make their recommendation. They will write instruction for diet. But we are dealing with the problem of owner's compliance. Yeah, I think one, one potential other solution is I've, I've noticed some of these pet 
supply stores also have low cost health maintenance plans for dogs and, and possibly for cats, where you then would have the opportunity to introduce maybe some low cost prevention along with uh, routine care over a period of time before they get to that late stage. The other thing that I was going to say is that you know, the pet food industry uh, is a multi-billion dollar industry in this country. And you can't even get the pet food, the various pet food companies to agree on what are ideal diets in terms of managing obesity. Everybody has their own ideas. Everybody has their own formulations. Even within our, my school, we've got three or four you know, board of nutrition PhD people, and they don't even agree. As far well, as there are a lot of my so colleagues. Uh, you actually have 51 faculty at Davis and 17 departments. It's our land-grant college in California. They're a really good department. There is a lot of controversy in humans because the biggest thing is compliance. So the high-protein, low-protein, high-fat, low-fat, New England Journal article, everybody lost the same amount of weight, and it wasn't very much. There actually are some physiological things that can be done, but the key problem is the pet food industry wants to sell more food. So if I found a food for you that the animal would eat less of, what is the economic incentive for the food company to now produce that when all they want to do is make it sweeter for the dog and the human and make them eat more of it and make it crunchier and nicer and you know make it softer and all the things that go against what the animal would have to deal with in the wild so i think for the zoo animals we were talking about the elephants for example this is a major factor because you got forced sedentary lifestyle can you create? Should humans be going to wild animal parks? And should we then have animal nutritionists seeding the proper wild food that these animals, which we have giraffes eating, you know, off of trees and things like that. And maybe that's a way to have people enjoy zoo animals rather than our traditional zoos that we have today. I think the other um, coin of the equation is um, uh, we have quite a bit of data documenting that dog obesity is related to owner's obesity and we can blame it on the owner. The question is, can we um, uh, include um, dog ownership as a strategy to tackle at the same time dog obesity as well as owner's obesity and especially in the context of uh, 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 obesity in children. Uh, absolutely. You know, 25% of obese and overweight individuals eat after dinner. So the very simple thing of taking your dog for a walk after dinner, and I always tell them the best exercise is walk away from the refrigerator. <laughs> so <laughs> by taking the dog out of the house, get the person out of the house, away from the cookies and get the dog around the block and stuff, it's a great thing. And uh, also in selecting a breed of dog that would do this is very important. Some dogs don't want to walk. You have to really work hard. And I thought the interesting thing when, you, you know, I watch these dog shows on TV. I don't know if it's right or not, but when the dogs are leading the people, you know, you really should be leading your dog, right? You're the alpha dog, is that right? <laughs> Let's take some questions. Um, it's Meredith, uh, yeah, Dr. Silver. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, two, two questions. Um, one, we're seeing in pediatric hospitals uh, uh, more gallbladder cholecystectomy than you can ever imagine in 10-year-old and 14-year-old groups. So it's really hitting at a younger age. Second thing I'd like you to deal with because it gets back to the psychology my impression dealing with these obese and fertile patients is that it's like when we're a baby and we cry, what do our parents do when they put a bottle in our mouth? So food is a way of soothing anxiety. And uh, I try to tell the patients once they have a baby, do they want the baby to be like them or not? And, uh, and that's a way of getting them to, because I don't think they need formulated diets. I think they know when they're eating incorrectly. It's a matter of their emotions. I think those are two great points, Dr. Silver. First of all, 40% uh, of the general United Kingdom population and the U.S. population have what's called fatty liver. And what happens is fructose, which is in the table sugar and high fructose corn syrup goes into the liver and fructose doesn't raise blood sugar but it's made into fat in the liver so you end up with fatty liver more insulin resistance and I meant to mention with Dr. Nelson's cat situation many and this is not proven but we have a big pancreatic cancer center here at UCLA many of the patients I've seen with pancreatic cancer have also had concomitant fatty liver gallbladder problems and fat in the pancreas itself which has been implicated in inflammation in the pancreas which may lead to pancreatic cancer. So those are very big issues. On the behavioral side, we found that 50% of the patients in our program, our obesity program here at UCLA called the Risk Factor Obesity Program, 50% are addicted 
to sugar. And it turns out Ernie Noble, who's in our Neuropsychiatric Institute, is a a famous alcoholism researcher found a polymorphism of a dopamine receptor uh, that makes the dopamine receptor less sensitive to pleasure. And this occurs in about 20% of alcoholics, and we've now found it in a comparable number of type 2 diabetics and obese patients. So food is a reward. There are There's a subpopulation of obese people who are literally addicted to food, and we're now working on uh, trying to define that food addiction and ways of treating it with cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is a very, very important area that you're working on. Okay. Um, a statement also for uh, obesity and, and owners and their dogs. There's a currently a uh, survey going on right now through the Southern California Veterinary Medical Association and LA County Public Health asking veterinarians, are they seeing that correlation? So hopefully we'll have data in this particular area, because I'm sure it's different across the country. And, and Dr. Nelson, I had a question for you. You did the post um, uh, treatment uh, with lente insulin. Have you done any other studies similar to it with using glargine? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you mean studies from the standpoint of using glargine and having undergo diabetic remission, or studies yeah, undergoing like remission and also taking a look at the pancreatic biopsy. If you're having similar, not similar with results. not with pancreatic biopsies, but there's very controversial in the veterinary endocrine arena as far as. Um, what's the best insulin in the cat, and um, to look at it, and, and that gets divided into two ways of saying, well, what's the best, best insulin? It does it give us best uh, blood sugar control, and the other way that people look at it is, does it induce diabetic remission? And so you get these wars going on right now of what's the best insulin as it relates to diabetic remission. And PZI will give you diabetic remission, Lenti, or can insulin, it's, it's sold in everywhere else but in this country, but Lenti insulin will give you diabetic remission, Detamir will give you a diabetic remission, Glart, they all will give you diabetic remission. Um, most of the studies have been done in relatively small populations, but one of the caveats that's out there is that we should be aggressive in our treatment. We should be trying to get that blood sugar down uh, between 50 and 100 literally, to try to induce remission and to uh, negate any potential toxic effects of hyperglycemia on beta cell function. And I consider that to be very dangerous in the cat because cats do not tolerate hypoglycemia and they can go into a uh, diabetic coma and, and end up being put down or die from a result of that. My approach has always been, I don't care which insulin you use, I think they all have the potential to be effective and they all have the potential to be ineffective in any given animal. I think what dictates remission is a combination of how many functional beta cells have you got left at the time that the diabetes is diagnosed, and what's the nature of the insulin resistance that's almost always affiliated with that, and can you control or treat that? I think, I think we need more research, too, on the body composition of animals. So I think that with, there's a number of non-invasive things. We use bioelectrical impedance because muscle is 70% water, conducts electricity, fat does not, to get a ratio of fat to lean. Um, I understand you'd probably have to anesthetize animals, you know, for MRI, but you could get some very interesting data correlating what you're finding in the way of um, insulin and the effectiveness of weight reduction, specific diets, et cetera, by getting more imaging techniques related specifically specifically to body fat versus body lean. And I think that might be a great area for translational research. 